Thank you, Bill, and thank you everyone for joining us again for the uh, the series of uh, concrete overlay webinars. Uh, this is the fifth and the final on this topic, but uh, we've got some good news uh, that we'll share with you and just a little bit about what we've got coming up down the road. So anyway, uh, today's focus is maintenance of concrete overlays, and we're also going to talk about some resources and some experiences in Indiana. So with that, I, just a reminder that we, uh, as the CP Tech Center, the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center uh, at Iowa State University, are working hard to be the nexus of the agency, industry, and academia, working together with them to make sure that we can provide pavement research and technology transfer. Our website is www.cptechcenter.org, and I certainly would encourage you to visit that if you haven't yet. There are a wealth of, of uh, resources on that website that are free to your utilization, and uh, we encourage you to check into that. So, The support for this webinar and the whole series has been the Portland Cement Association, the sponsors of the center, the Iowa Concrete Paving Association, the Iowa DOT, and especially the American Concrete Pavement Association is helping, helping us navigate this, and, uh, and their chapters who are also participants, and for the National Concrete Consortium, uh, consortium of state DOTs that we work with uh, on a regular basis who have helped uh, make this possible also. So we want to thank them for their assistance. Uh, Bill already mentioned who the speakers were. Here's the uh, uh, email addresses, if you want to get in touch with any of them. Uh, we're really appreciative of Matt Zeller and Steve and Mike uh, join us today. Uh, one of the things we do at the CP Tech Center is that uh, we certainly work a lot with the technology and technology transfer, but we also work very uh, diligently to make sure that we bring people from around the country into our webinars to assist us uh, in making sure that we get the expertise around the country and share those stories with you. Uh, we're trying to stay within a one hour uh, time frame on the webinar. And so we do encourage you to ask questions in the question box on your screen. And, uh, and what we will do then is I will share those with the speakers. We'll get the questions answered and then distribute them to all the participants. Uh, we certainly uh, want to make sure that we to, uh, do respond to your questions and encourage you to, to give those to us. As mentioned earlier, this is the session on maintenance of concrete overlays and resources available to you. Uh, again, uh, we're going to, as we have throughout, we're going to have examples of how concrete overlays are performing around the country, spotlighting or showcasing today the experience in Indiana with Mike Byers. Now, the good news is that we will continue the webinars uh, in the coming months and uh, want to let you know that what's coming next on May 12th and May 19th at noon central time, similar to what we've been doing, is a focus on design issues and solutions for American Disabilities Act on streets, roads, highways, and parking lots. A big topic, uh, especially with DOTs and the agencies at the local level, uh, it's not really just focusing on concrete, but there are some aspects of concrete that we want to share with you uh, with regard to ADA. And uh, we've got uh, Jesse Jonas and Jackie Spore. Uh, Jesse's with the Missouri Kansas ACPA chapter, and Jackie's with the Wisconsin uh, Concrete Pavement Association. They will be sharing over that two seminar uh, period uh, some of their experiences. Uh, Jesse has had a lot of experience in previous jobs with ADA, and I think you will find it very useful and uh, and quite informative. So. Looking forward to that, and you will continue to get notices about these webinars as we move down the road. So with that, as I turn it over to Matt, I want to say thanks for questions and for joining us today. Uh, in a several days, you will receive a link to the recording, a copy of the PowerPoint, PDH certificate, and the questions and answers. So you'll have that to look forward to, and uh, as soon as we can get those prepared, we'll get them sent off to you. So with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Matt Zeller. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, let's get my screen up going here. Um, again, thanks again for inviting me and um, 
talk a little bit today about repair of thin concrete overlays and what's been done, what's available out there to you. Um, why repair our thin overlays? Again, because these thin overlays are relatively new. Um, Iowa, I think, has you know built more than most, but they've been really successful. So we haven't had a lot of opportunities to to fix these things. So again, you know, you know, why fix them? Why not? You know, I, again. So let's start with what we know, our standard CPR practices. And as we move forward, you know, we're going to learn from our mistakes. Just wanted to show you a couple of quick pictures here in the beginning. So I'm not a Maytag repairman, but, and this is a really bad picture because it's an LG, not a Maytag. But um, I had to tear this thing apart three years ago, um, get down to the guts of it, and, um, and got it back running. Um, my washing machine, it wasn't a big deal. Um, little education, a couple of YouTube videos, and then uh, got her figured out. Same thing. There's a 30-year-old, one of the earliest jet skis. Um, again, the impeller on the backside wasn't working right. I had to pull the guts out of it, uh, kind of rebuilt that, put it back together. Again, um, why not fix it? Um, most importantly for a lot of guys, you know, here's my uh, a picture of a beer fridge. It's not mine, but mine looks a lot like this. It's usually pretty stock. But again, it wasn't cooling right. My beer wasn't cold. So um, tore apart the backside and it was just a small fan condenser blow that cools off the condenser Had a actually had a frog jumped in there and got wedged in the blades and wasn't letting the fan run. But again, you have these things, let's take care of them. Um, so again, we'll get into the presentation. Um, just to talk again a little bit about what bonded overlays are, um, our normal concrete pavement preservation activities, typical distresses in bonded concrete overlays some repair techniques, and um, I want to share a quick success story with you. So again, just a quick update. Anybody that's been on these uh, webinars the last few weeks has probably seen this slide more than enough. But a typical bonded overlay, we've got our concrete over top of the prepared asphalt. You know, you know here's what it looked like before. And once in a while in our, in our overlays, some of these, these flaws in the old asphalt are going to come through, whether it's a crack, a longitudinal crack, we've got an area where we we don't have good support. So those flaws in the concrete are going to come back through. And I tell all the folks I work with, you know, as we're building these, if we went out and tried to fix every problem in the asphalt ahead of time, it's going to cost us a lot of money to do this overlay. So we don't focus too much on patching and, and fixing the flaws in the asphalt. We do our overlay and if things show up later, we can come out and fix them. So again, traditional concrete pavement preservation activities, we start from up here about one o'clock. We've got our partial depth patching we can do where we just remove some some of the top of the material. Um, the flaws are in the top of the concrete and we clean that back up and patch it. Or we could do slab stabilization, slab jacking, where we uh, drill some holes and press, pressure grout some of the slab uh, and back into place. Full depth repairs, really common around the country where we pull out either portions of a panel or full panels or even multiple panels, depending on what's going on there. We could also do get into cross-stitching where we drill diagonal holes through across, across a, a longitudinal crack typically, and we bind those back together with a grouted tie bar to prevent it from moving vertically or horizontally. Dial bar retrofits uh, been pretty big over the last couple decades where we drill some slots in the old concrete and pop those out and retrofit in some dowel bars or some sort of load transfer device and patch that back into place. Um, joint and crack resealing has been, again, around for decades. And then last, uh, diamond grinding, diamond grooming to get our smoothness back. And so I just want, I really want to highlight some of the thin overlay load load related distresses and a lot of the photos in here I, sh I need to give Dr. Julie Vandenbush at University of Pittsburgh um, I need to thank her for allowing me to use some of her slides and steal some of her photos along with Tom Burnham from MnDOT um, but most of the crack things we'll see is some sort of cracking and we can have some diagonal cracking as we see here up in this picture or where the joints come together in this in this case it's a smaller joint spaces that landed in a wheel path um, where we get some transverse cracking or some longitudinal cracking. And again, a lot of that is uh, indicative of some sort of load related distress. Um, we've seen with some of our overlays as we lose support 
the concrete actually compresses the asphalt down below, so we actually lose support at some of these corners, so the corners crack. Uh, once in a while, it's just lo it's localized. Sometimes we've seen where it goes on and on and on down some of the panels. Also, uh, another uh, you'll see some reflective cracking out there. Again, we don't see a lot of it, but you know, once in a while it shows up. Uh, sometimes you need to fix it. Sometimes you don't. And so again, the source of most of the material here is a good publication that's out there. Again, um, put together by by Julie. Uh, but it's, it's a great spot to get started on repairing your, your overlays. Um, and again, it goes through mostly full depth repairs. And there's a link down below if you want to if you want to pull up this whole document. And we look at mostly two types of repairs. You know, an isolated repair, we've got, you know, one flaw, one problem going on. So we might pull out, you know, a panel or two panels. Or we've got more of a uniform distress that's ongoing where we've got a, a, a prolonged soft spot or something. So we'll look at the, both the full depth repairs for those isolated repairs and for um, a longer type repair. So if you're going to take care of those isolated repairs with a full depth repair, you want to take some cores. Um, again, you don't have to take it at every repair location, you want, but you want to get an idea of what's going on down there. You want to see if your asphalt is delaminated. Um, if your concrete is thick enough, um, it give you an idea of why something might be happening. And when you get in there, you want to make sure that you mill at you know to at least uh, three quarters to an inch above uh, a layer, a lift line in your asphalt. You want to make sure that you have enough of that asphalt left. If you don't, it's uh, pretty easy for that to come off, and then again debond down below. So what you want to do is you want to mark out your repair areas. You want to identify what you want to pull out of there. And then give it kind of a four inch boundary. So in this case, we're going to mill that out of there. So you want to leave that four inch perimeter left so that uh, we don't damage the concrete that's going to be left in place. And so then the, rem the remainder of that, then you just bring some lightweight uh, jackhammers out and remove those. After that, if you've got that pulled out of there, you want to clean it up. You know, so you can, again, you can. Pull it out of there. You can power sweep that. You know, you may have to clean some things up with some lightweight hammers, light, uh, handheld hammers, um, brooms. In this case, on the right-hand side, they're using a vacuum to pull it out of there. But again, you want to get it all out of there so we can get a good bond back with the old asphalt. And again, just replacing the slab is just like uh, doing any other repair. So you want to come in with some compressed air to blow out the dust and the fines right before you're going to place the, your new concrete patch repair mix. Um, mist that area as well. You don't want that, if that gets hot, you don't want that uh, either making your concrete set from the bottom or pulling moisture out of your mix. So you want to mist that, you know, get that wet a little bit. And then you want to place and consolidate your concrete, strike it off to make it level, reestablish any joints if you have to. T over three, if you're going to saw those back in, is our um, what most people use. And then if you seal it, then I'll go that route. You also might have to repair a panel that has reflective crack. Um, again, these these are not the same pictures, but they're similar. You can see the shoulder in both this side, and you look all the way across the road. That's where the crack was, and it just that's where it wanted to crack. So we, even though we put a joint nearby, the the crack went out. So you have to pull those panels out of there. Again, with the similar methods that we did before, and you want to make sure that. You know, we don't get any concrete down into that crack. We don't want to bond there, and we don't want to get any any grout down in there. And then just, again, pour your um, your mix. And But you want the big thing you want to do here is you want to reestablish that, that joint in your new concrete patch where that crack was. So identify at both ends of that on your slab where that crack was so you can come back and either tool that in or saw that back in so that now it's going to crack where the crack is. I mean, if we put a joint back where it what where it used to be, it's just going to crack right through this area again. Uh, again, once in a while we have those longer stretches where we've got to pull out, um, you know, several panels or even hundreds of feet. Again, you want to pull some cores just again to make sure you know what you've got going on. You, you know, it might be see if you can figure out why it cracked. Maybe the asphalt delaminated. Maybe due to the milling process ahead of time when you built it originally, 
you didn't give yourself enough thickness on your new concrete overlay. So again, take some cores, take a look at it, see if you can figure out why it happened. Double check your your overlay thickness. You know that you know if you should have had five inches and you only had three inches, that might be the reason. So make sure you get that milled out deep enough to give you a you know the right thickness. Um, and you know again, use conventional milling operations to remove the uh, the material planned. And again, this is something that hasn't been done a lot, but we have seen that milling machines can pull that concrete out of there. Uh, may, might need uh, different teeth, might go through teeth faster, but we can mill that out of there and uh, for replacement. And then again, like any other patch, then we're just going to clean it up, you know, after we get it milled to the proper elevation, get the right thickness in there. You want to broom it, you know, in this case, they got a power broom, you come in, get, get rid of all that uh, material to make sure you get a good bond. And again, the placement of the patch is just like any other. so. Uh, here's a picture of up at uh, Min Road where we're using a, a slip form paver. They've got a roller screed in the uh, upper right. And then the bottom two pictures, again, are just uh, photos of placing that concrete with uh, with the paver again. One thing, again, you want to make sure is that your asphalt is not too hot. Because if it if it's too hot, it, it'll set your concrete. Your concrete will set up from the bottom, and it'll crack where it wants to. It won't crack at your joints. And, again, the also the... the uh, misting that surface helps uh, make sure it doesn't uh, pull any uh, paste out of the, the concrete or water out of the concrete up above. So again, the, again, placement is just conducted using our usual methods. And then after our placement and finishing, you want to make sure you cure it right. And again, this goes like with any concrete patch, any, any sort of concrete repair, it needs to be cured correctly. If you don't do that, you're really, really putting yourself in danger of having uh, flaws show that right back up. Sawing joints, again, conventional methods can be used. This just shows a span saw, typically to one third of the depth. And if you're going to come back and, and seal it, typically most people use hot pour without any sort of backer rod. Last thing I wanted to show you in here is, uh, this wasn't in, in Julie's document, but um, what I'm going to show you here in some photos coming up is partial depth repairs. A lot of people ask if we can do partial depth repairs and People have historically said, uh, for these thin overlays, we're going to have to pull them out and replace them. And I'll show you photos of, of very successful partial depth repairs. We can do them. Um, again, you've got to have sound concrete down below like you would for any other partial depth repair. But again, just typical removal and, removal and repair process for the partial depth repair as well. And then last, um, come back and you can diamond grind it to re restore the, the, the smoothness of the road. Like just our standard methods. And in this case, you can use a, a moving closure. Um, a lot of different things can be done to make sure you're not interrupting traffic too much. A couple of slides I just wanted to show you from Min Road. Again, these are not all overlay related, but they're thin pavements. And in case anybody wants to try some of these things on their pavement. So in this case, though, we're look, just looking at some panel replacements on a six by six by six stretch of Min Road. Um, here's another one on the six by on uh, no, six inch uh, thin overlay, but as you can see, it's they were 12 foot long panels and six foot wide, and as I say, there it shows plate dowels on the basket. Kind of hard to see here, but right there, right there, right there, right there, those are some plate dowels that we installed, we built with that uh, original overlay, and they were working just fine. And in in this case, even though it was a long panel and narrow. 12 foot long by six foot wide, we ended up with some longitudinal cracking. So that was the reason we had to pull these out. You know, I think right here is where one of the cracks was, but the, the dowels themselves seem to be working fine. Here's where we tried to do a, uh, a retrofit with some of the plate dowels. And again, the patching material didn't hold this. In this case, it didn't work out too well. Um, here's a five inch thick on aggregate base though. And again, we did some repairs here. And we tried the Covex dowels, kind of the football-shaped dowels. And you can see where they broke out around the perimeter. But what's kind of interesting to note here is it broke out and cracked in the existing concrete, not in the repairs. The repairs look fine. Um, again, another six-inch thick on aggregate base and with the plate dowels again, the Covex plate dowels. Here we had a little few more dowels, and it worked. 
you know, you can see there were no distresses in the in the pavement. But on one where we use a few less, use less dowels, in this case five, you can see it broke out again on the perimeter. So again, we can retrofit some of these things back in there. Last thing I wanted to talk about was a project that we built back in 1993. This is our very first uh, white topping thin overlay job. It's down in uh, southern Minnesota. And it was uh, 10 miles long, and it was a five inch thick BCOA. Uh, we had four test sections in there. One was just, again, part of the five inch, um, all one mile long, where we could compare results of how performance of each of the different sections. And so we had a five inch, just a standard overlay. We did a five inch dowel overlay. We did a six inch standard overlay and a six inch dowel overlay. All of these use six or 12 by 12 joint spacing. This was before we were really, really focused on the smaller joint spacing. And again, this is not a high volume road. It's, it's out in the middle of the country, but it was a very, very nice place to try this, a safe spot. And uh, it's, it's actually doing quite well. About 20 years after it was built, we rehabbed it. And within that rehab, we had about 150,000 lineal feet of joint and crack seal. That was, I think, all, that was all the joints and cracks on the job. We also did 21,000 lineal feet of full depth repair where we pulled out and replaced the whole, the depth of the, the, the concrete. But what we also did is we did 54,000 lineal feet of partial depth joint repair. So again, those are where we're taking off just the top portion of the joint. And then we also did 3,400 square feet of spot partial depth. We all, so out in the middle of a panel where some sort of flaw showed up, we cleaned that up. And then we also diamond ground about 80% of the job. And what I wanted to show you here mostly is that the partial depth repairs. And again, you know, everyone's seen full depths and, and those work. But these are, you know, I went out last week and took these. And so these are very, very common. These are, you know, all worked out well. And you can see this is along a center line joint, uh, all four quadrants, um, partial depth, you know, um, eight years after the fact, everything looks beautiful out there. Here's a longitudinal crack that goes into a full depth repair. And you can see at the very top of the screen that longitudinal crack and the partial depth repair continue on. But this partial depth repair is performing just great. Um, here's another partial depth repair at a joint. It, you know, it's most of the width of the length of the joint and then crosses over the center line and goes a couple of feet into the next uh, lane. And then last um, was just a partial depth spot repair. And again, there was nothing about these mixes. They weren't souped up mixes. They weren't proprietary mixes. These are our standard partial depth repair mixes that, that were reused. And everything is, is really performing well. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up and pass things off to Steve Treach. Thank you, Matt. Get mine pulled up here real quick, shouldn't take very long. I'm just going to uh, essentially list a couple of resources, publications, in addition to what uh, Matt stated in regard to the document that Julie uh, has written uh, several years ago. So very quickly, I think I have about six of them, six slides. Uh, the first one's an MH, FHWA Innovative Spotlight, what they call them. Uh, it's essentially for local public agencies, but there's some very good information on this website in regard to concrete pavement preservation. Several videos that have recently been completed, I think you'll find them uh, most informative. There's also uh, some case studies that Missouri DOT did. Uh, it was published a couple of years ago. Mike Darter did uh, that particular study. And the nice thing about that is there's six tech briefs, or essentially six case studies in there where they actually went out and looked at actual projects. This is a, a concrete pavement distress manual that the CP Tech Center put together. Uh, there's a number of chapters in there. Uh, I think we have 15 listed. The nice thing about uh, a lot of the, well, essentially all of the CP Tech Center documents are they're, they're free. Uh, almost all of them now you can essentially download as a PDF. Uh, the more recent ones, they're 
essentially interactive PDFs where we may have links within those embedded to essentially go to another document for further detail. But you'll note uh, on chapter 14, that's where we have our concrete overlays, uh, quite a bit of information in regard to potential distresses that might show up in regard to what you might be looking for. There's a, a map brief. Uh, the center does put out map briefs quarterly. Uh, the one that we are showing here is uh, concrete overlay performance, essentially on the Iowa roadways, uh, a very extensive study. Uh, that actually came out uh, in the other report for the field data report, July of 2017. I think there's over like 2,000 miles of uh, essentially county road projects that have been pretty well documented, uh, shows the good and the bad. But I, I think when you look at that, you'll see that there's a, a, indeed a lot of good performance uh, over a number of years. And this is something that just came online recently, about uh, four months ago. It's web-based training. It's free, and it's uh, essentially an NHI contractor training course. There's five of them, but I listed two here that are certainly germane to what Matt showed earlier. And that's essentially the full depth repairs as well as the partial depth repairs. Within each one of these training courses, there's up to maybe seven, eight, segments that uh, you would be viewing. Uh, very up-to-date, very modern, uh, several videos that are embedded within the, the presentation. So I would encourage you, if you want a little bit more detail on both the uh, full depth and partial depth, uh, very good web-based training application. And lastly, this is Hot Off Press, just came out in April 2020. Uh, WSB put this uh, synthesis together on concrete pavement restoration for bonded concrete overlay of asphalt. So certainly germane as to the topic today. Uh, there's 25 figures in there, so I think you'll find those interesting in addition to eight tables. It's a fairly concise document and only 51 pages. Uh, it's almost easier. I do have the uh, URL up there, but it's almost easier just to go into Google and you know look up NRRA and it essentially pops up right away. So those are a few uh, resources that might be of interest to you. Again, you'll see these slides when you get the PDFs that are sent out uh, at a later date. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and he's gonna give you a little bit of history of some projects in Indiana. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's take a few minutes here to review the Indiana experience regarding how we move towards concrete overlays as a preservation option within the state system. First, is like in most states, our 11 plus thousand miles of network are showing some age, and but we've moved into the, a lot of the preservation mode in the system. We're still building a few new new alignments and some reconstruct, but a large share of the system is preservation mode and so the industry had discussions with the the agency as to whether concrete overlays which had significant experience in other states might be a rehabilitation option in the preservation that might provide a longer term a rehab option we'd had significant use of concrete overlays in the local market and particularly in general market six inch overlay very well and we uh, talked to the DOT and as you can see there now the DOT has embarked upon a program they built 10 overlays to date. Some of the things that kind of drove the discussion that uh, allowed consideration was some of the new technologies that have come along. Uh, the, the advancement of high strength macro synthetic fibers providing residual strength gain in Indiana established that we would target a 20% residual strength gain for our Fiber dosage, um, and we and we did pretty significant research on it. We went to Illinois, who'd done a lot of research, and went to their their testing center and reviewed the work they had done regarding macro synthetic fibers, and and we decided upon the twenty percent, and that pretty much gives us a five to four to five cubic yards of fibers uh, dosage in the in the mixtures. And the concept reason we the industry was interested and the DOT was interested was that the 
This would now allow us to go to a thinner concrete overlay, which would allow the rehab to be done within a lot of the existing alignment without changing elevation grades, et cetera, et cetera. The other question the DOT asked was, okay, you say these perform well, show us some data on performance. So Indiana uses the pathways system for data collection for their uh, pavement management system. And we were able to have the pathways group collect some data on some existing Indiana overlays and several overlays in the state of Illinois. The state analyzed that data and confirmed that yes, these do have the potential to provide long-term service. So we had new technology, some data, and the state says, okay, we're gonna look at considering a few of these on some trial projects. We decided we would do only structural fiber reinforced overlays. We would target four to six inch. So therefore we put that in what we call a thin overlay category the four to six inch. We would do concrete overlays over old pavement, or I'm sorry, old asphalt pavements. We looked at old asphalt or old composite pavements. So that was our target and the search was on to look for some projects. The concept was we'd look in, Indiana has six districts. We'd look in each of the districts to try and identify two or three projects that would be good candidates. Again, the classification was four to six inches. The goal was to let them by the end of 2017, and a few of those projects lagged into 18 lettings. But they did let 10 projects to, as a good sampling of the system. As far as our design guidance, uh, the goal was to design for 20 years. The settle on a six by six panel to keep the joints out of the wheel paths, some other trials had used four by four, but the wheel path caused a little bit of issues. So six by six panel was settled on. Joints would be saw cut, no dowels was the concept of the design. We developed a new, after the discussion, we developed a new, what's referred to in our state as a unique special provision for concrete overlays. A um, few of the highlights, uh, still very, we have lots and Sublots for quality control, quality assurance sampling. Um, we're taking cores. We're very, this spec is very stringent on thickness and take two cores. The designs are pretty tight and so we don't want a thin pavement. A couple items of note is to allow people to get cross over the pavement into their homes and businesses where we settled on a 350 PSI flexure to open to local traffic which is about eight hours and most of our strength gains uh, and the, the same spec as normal 550 to open the construction traffic. One of the items that was kind of new in this spec and we learned after the first couple of jobs was we needed to do some construction engineering to get good control of the milling operation and the final elevation of the pavement. So, so that became a bid item for construction engineering for the contractor to come in basically do some elevation measurements on the existing pavement, knowing what the new profile was supposed to be and establish a minimum overlay depth across the pavement so that we maintain the pavement thickness. So they set up control for milling operation to establish the, the grade under the new overlay and then basically allowed the, the profile grade to establish in the top per the plans. And the goal there was we provided a provision to allow for additional payment of concrete that was over the neat line calculation for the thickness of the overlay. Uh, but the idea here was to try and minimize that potential so that it uh, we control it. So once we started controlling the milling operation to grade and then the final the thickness of the performance of the of the sections have turned out very well. A couple other interesting options. There's a significant amount of research done in the state for joint durability. One of the questions was, man, if we're going to have six by six panels with a lot of joints, we need to make sure our joints are going to be durable. One of those findings was that we needed to have an SCM. So as you can see here, we have, um, we lowered our cement content too. So we have a total minimum cement content of 500, or we used to be at 564, then it was 520, now it's 500. Um, Required, as you see up in the upper heading there, this, the concrete mix design shall contain at least one, but no more than two SCMs. So they, there's a requirement to have a result of the research to have a 
SEM in the in the mix, you see there 20 to 40 percent fly ash or 25 to 40 percent um, uh, silica, not silica fume, but uh, slag cement. Um, the other interesting comment would be that um, we did drop the minimum Portland cement content to 350. So it's a it's a very uh, durability friendly mix based on the research that got us to this point. A couple other comments in the specifications. If we found after early project that if we had a gap pour to allow traffic to a business or subdivision or homes that if it was greater than 60 feet, we put a relief joint at both ends. The standard practice was if it's less than 50, we would put a relief joint at the, the end of the concrete pour before we started the gap pour. Joints are sawed perpendicular an eighth of an inch in width. T over three, as Matt mentioned, we, we've adopted the T over three too, and our joints are not filled or sealed. Pairing is because of the wide area, square footage versus thickness, we've adopted a provision for two applications of white pigment. And so the standard process is to use a tiny cure machine, do the tining, moving forward, spray backing up and then spray coming back forward until you get to the point where you can tie it again. And we have a smoothness requirement um, for any pavement over 45 mile an hour. Couple lessons learned uh, from our projects and recap of the projects. As I said, in INDOT, after the move forward has let 10 projects, uh, approximately 1.5 million square yards, and they're a nice mixture of projects, some on asphalt, some on composite, some two lane, some four lane, allowed to test different types of paving operations uh, and also to different type of maintenance of traffic. One of the first, I'll re I'm gonna recap three or four projects here. One of the first ones is a, a State Route 3 between Muncie and Newcastle. It's a four lane divided highway. It's about a 12 and a half mile stretch of pavement. Uh, Design was a four and a half inch structural fiber overlay. We milled the existing HMA on PCC, used six by six joints. Again, no dowels, none of these had dowels in them. We'd, the decision was made to maintain traffic and construct under traffic, but maintain one lane northbound and southbound uh, with barrels in between. You'll see in a couple of pictures here. Maintain access to residents also, 336,000 square yards at 20 bucks a square yard. About 45% of the pavement was constructed in 17, the remainder in 18. Here you can see the, probably you can see to the right hand side of the picture, you, you'll see a barrel there, but there's a the pavement being paved one lane at a time. Here you can see traffic running along the outside shoulder, work in progress. A little bit of the finished product here, the pavement ended up with a replacement of a thin HMA shoulder, but you can see the main line there, the four and a half, six by six panel. Turned out to be a very nice project. The, on that project, the structural fibers were added, the contractor added an extra belt into way hopper just above the, where it went into the mixer. Uh, they were mainly added by bag, dissolvable bags run up the conveyor, into the mix and no no real problem with mixing or dis distribution of the fibers. Second project is going to discuss is a two lane route. It's the second phase of a state route 161. The very original first overlay was a six inch conventional overlay. This is a four and a half inch fiber reinforced again six by six panels. The original project had 12 by 12, um, but 56,000 square yards. It was a Paul 2017 project. Here you can see a finished photo of it, one one photo in place uh, while they're building it there. Uh, one lane built, traffic run to the side. In this job, the traffic is run one way, local traffic only through the project. Um, they ran from the north end through the south end. Uh, you can see here there's a lot of people viewing this construction this day, a fairly large group from Kentucky Transportation Cabinet came up to view the paving. Um, 
and they've since looked at a couple concrete overlays in their state. You can see the finished product on the left there. Another two-lane route, and the reason we show this one is that it was a, again, a four and a half inch overlay, but the nice part here was it was a rural route where we could actually close the road down for the southern four mile of the job and we paved it 30 feet wide. So as you can see here in the upper left hand, the concrete being supplied to the paver, um, followed by the full width of the, being paved full width, see the Dyna Cure machine back behind it, but it's nice if we were able to pave this full width, it created a great coherent uh, fiber reinforced slab all the way across the pavement. You can see a close up and a, Freshly cured pavement there. The other item this pavement had was it was designed with rumble stripes, as we call them. Um, you can see here the pavement's textured for the paint stripe, and then it's also been the uh, ground for the rumble strips. The key thing there is you have to avoid, you got six by six panels, so you have to make sure you miss the, the joint location. The Fourth project, the final project is another State Route 9 job. This was south of a town called Shelbyville. It was a, again, this was a six inch and a widening. It was two lanes wide, um, but it, it had a three foot shoulder widening and depth. So it had a, where we tacked the tie bar on the top edge of pavement and went from a six inch to an eight inch shoulder. Um, also, the, this project, we demonstrated that uh, we could pave a safe, safety edge along with the pavement. So you can see there at the outside edge of the shoulder, there's a, a safety edge being slipped for them with the paver. One of the things we learned is all the projects were built using traditional construction. And originally some contractors had apprehensions they'd be able to pave 15 foot wide, 12 foot wide, 30 foot wide, four inches deep or four and a half inches deep. But they found that it paved very well, particularly with the fibers in there. They held their depth very, very well, paved very smoothly. Um, so conventional construction with traditional pavers, we milled all of our surfaces. We milled the old asphalt off to get to the proper elevation grade. So the surface was milled and cleaned and all the concrete was either placed via a ready mix truck, dumped directly in front via belt placer or dumped out of an open bed truck. We had all three kinds of application in front of the paver, but all worked exceptionally well as far as traditional construction goes. We still do a transverse tying in Indiana, so it's a divisional transverse tying. Almost all used a tying, tying and cure machine. You see the texture there. We did traditional curing. Other than we require, as I mentioned to call before, the two coats. So what you see here is the paving to the left hand at north edge of the Picture there, the tine and cure machine tines as close as it can to the pavement before it's pavement's still too too wet. Uh, then then they cure, moving back, and then they come back and cure back up to where they're ready to tine again. So there you can see it in full cure. The goal when we're done is to have a curing coverage equivalent to the sheet, sheet of white paper. Sign we the Contractors pretty much utilize early entry saws for all these projects. Uh, you see the note there says, be ready. We had to alert everybody that there are a lot more joints here and a pavement's thinner. You need to make sure you have sufficient saws on site so you can. Uh, like to mention, we pick several different applications and address different concerns on traffic control. I think we've the contractors and the industry proved that we were able to manage pretty much any situation we face. The very first projects were two lane routes that had uh, traffic control close to everything but local traffic and the local traffic was allowed to move um, through the through the project in one way and then was managed fairly well. And they like say there was room for trucks to come in and out and room for the paver to, to pave. Mentioned earlier that State Route 3 job was a four-lane route, um, and the, the option there was to 
pavement under traffic, but move traffic to the outside, then move it on the new pavement and pave the outside. Worked fairly well. We tried a couple later projects where we closed down and cross traffic over. Those worked even better. I think that standard moving forward would probably be if we can to uh, cross traffic over and then have one side shut down where we could pay full width. I mentioned that State Route 9 job had the opportunity, had rural route, pretty wide, a right of way, some fairly uh, wide space shoulders available for access of trucks and vehicles and people could get to their homes via the the side ditches. So they, uh, we, for those four miles, we paved a full width as a trial, worked very, very well. And then one where we had a lot more traffic on the state round nine job south of Shelbyville, on the southern end of that job, there was extensive truck traffic from three aggregate quarries and some additional cars. So with that one, we implemented the contractor implemented use of portable traffic signals and a pilot car to manage traffic in that. And that likewise proven to work pretty well when you have the tight constraints of traffic to manage through the job. So the next steps in Indiana are the, are they, all the projects they've built, they're evaluating. We've had a few things that people are saying, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that. So we're adjusting some scope. We learned in a couple jobs that if you don't, if you just core down in the center of the road and you and think that's your section, you may be fooled that actually a lot of those overall roads were widened at some point in time and not nearly as stout a section as the main line. So we've lost a little bit of support at the outside edge of pavement uh, that has caused a little bit of cracking that we're looking at making sure we better evaluate what is there in the future. But uh, so we're making some of those adjustments to the scoping and investigation requirement, adjusting a few design details in the spec, not too extensive. I think we're looking at a couple other um, Still, we'll still stay with the same T over three, I think, sawing details and uh, six foot joint space. Considerations are going to PAM's carrying compound instead of a white pigment and only be one coat, but that's still not finalized. So currently the process is after evaluating, looking at these and establishing the, any changes that the, the agency is looking now for future concrete overlay candidate projects. There's a few been identified, they're being refined. So hopefully starting back in after this COVID process allows a little more evaluation to start letting a few more projects in late 2020 or 2021. With that, that concludes my presentation. As you can see as a summary slide, we, we think concrete overlays are a viable pavement preservation option. The data is shown and the Iowa study showed significant long-term performance out of them. Ours have proven to be cost competitive. They've proven to be constructible with traditional methods and we've not found any maintenance of traffic issues we haven't been able to solve. So we think they're worth taking a look at. With that, you, I turn it back over to Gordon, I believe. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Again, we certainly appreciate everybody's participation today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in several days, we should you should receive a link to the recording. Uh, the PowerPoint and PDF format uh, will be sent out to everyone that participated today, and also the PDH certificate, and finally the Q and A. I was looking here a little bit ago. There's a lot of questions that came in today. Uh, if you still have questions, please uh, plan to uh, continue to enter those for a while. Bill's going to stay online for a little while the, and uh, allow you the time to go ahead and enter the questions into the question box. And as mentioned earlier, uh, once we get there, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get those answered and get them out to you. Just a couple other uh, housekeeping things here. Uh, I already mentioned, uh, but I want to remind you about the ADA uh, series, the series of two presentations that we're going to have on uh, Tuesday, May 12th and Tuesday, May 19th. Uh, really a, a good 
uh, overview. I saw part of it last week, and I think you'll find that it's very helpful to try and understand, to some extent, some of the challenges that our disab disabled people have to deal with and why we're uh, focusing so much on making sure that we can make things accessible to them. And then it looks like in uh, the latter part of May, the 26th and the first uh, week of June, we'll uh, have a, a series on concrete pavement preservation in general, uh, preventive maintenance and pavement evaluation, and the various treatment operations kind of to build a little bit on some of what we've learned today. Uh, uh, we really, really look forward to uh, continuing this. Uh, I think that one of the things that we want to uh, encourage you to do is participate in the topic survey. Uh, we've had that available for several weeks. Uh, you can see the link to it there on your screen. Get on there if you haven't yet and let us know what some of your interests are with regard to uh, concrete pavements or related topics. Uh, we're going to be working very closely with the ACPA national and also the chapters to identify and, and to, to look at your uh, surveys and come up with a, a good consensus of what are the needs out there so that we can put the team together that can uh, address those issues in our upcoming webinars down the road. We're really thrilled with the numbers that we've had. I think we were very close to 750 or more today. Uh, have had great participation. We know that part of that's uh, with our challenges of uh, staying home and, and uh, not being able to be quite as accessible to other things. Uh, but we, we also think that this may be a, a good uh, indicator of how we're going to communicate a lot of this information in the future. So if you've got any suggestions or any thoughts, uh, please, please help us out with that. And I think with that, uh, again, we want to we want to thank our uh, uh, speakers, Matt Zeller with uh, Concrete Paving Minis Association of Minnesota, Steve Treach, uh, my coworker here at the CP Tech Center, uh, and Mike Byers from Indiana. I think the presentations today and throughout the whole series have been great to share some of the things that are going on around the country.